Okay, we're back, we're live. We're here with Kevin Newt of the School of Architecture at UH Manoa. And we're talking about time and space today. And that's important because we live in an altered universe here with, with COVID and reopening and the like. You know, all these tensions and dichotomies and threats. It's, it's interesting because it affects our lives so dramatically. Uh, more dramatically, I think, than we fully understand it. Kevin's gonna help us understand that. Good morning, Kevin. Good morning, Jay. Nice to meet you. Okay. Now you fashioned this title, you know, the the uh, contention of time and space, and which one would you prefer? Uh, I'll let you explain what you meant by that, but I, I can only tell you that it's something close to E equals M C squared. <laughs> well, uh, the original title I, I stole uh, blatantly, shamelessly from Marcel Proust, "In Search of Lost Time," um, because I think that architecture, uh, to a large extent, uh, certainly modern architecture, has lost time if it ever had time, um, which is another question. But, uh, you know, if we go back to, uh, um, it's a good intro, actually, uh, uh, Einstein, 100 years ago, roughly, he got the Nobel Prize basically for saying these two things are joined at the hip. You, know, you can't talk about space without talking about time. Well, architects uh, do a pretty good job of doing very little but talk about space without talking about time. And yet, uh, if you were to stop somebody in the street, uh, you know, probably 99 out of 100 people in answer to the question, which is more important to you, space or time, would answer time. So there's a real mismatch uh, between what architects are kind of preoccupied with space. And then the rest of the world um, is really um, much more interested in, in time. Um, and if you like, I could explain why. I think it's self-evident, but um, we- Well, I, I just like to make two comments at this point in your- Yeah and your progression uh, number one is uh, that you know i more and more i know that it sounds crazy but more and more I, I look back to the classical times of the greeks and romans uh, standing around in their temples and bathhouses and what have you and i think they were probably um less interested in time and more interested in space um that it was static you know they built those things to last for a thousand years and right. there was uh, you know nothing renewable about them they, they were great and uh, they they stayed great till uh, until the Rome fall, Rome fell, or Greece fell. Um, the other, the other, the other comment I wanted to make is that um, time is relevant to architecture in the sense, and maybe it should be more relevant to architecture in the sense that things get old, they deteriorate, um, and the world changes around them. Um, and you can't, you can't have a building like the Romans and the Greeks did that was intended to last for a thousand years because. Um, the world changes around you. Even a condo, uh, you know, that has a, a lease of say 55 years, um, you know, they should take it down after that. In in Singapore, they make you take it down. You can't, you know, you gotta, you gotta, uh, you know, destroy the building after a period of time. Condos here, ca capable of lasting two, three, four hundred years, is a business. It's a business matter that doesn't require reinvestment. But as a practical matter, it's wrong. We have to renew our architecture. Interesting. Um, there's a lot in there. I mean, I, I, uh, uh, for sure, they weren't as obsessed with time in classical uh, uh, period. Uh, um, they did measure time, you know, they, they developed some of the earliest clocks, quarter clocks, etc. Um, but they were less obsessed than we are. I would argue that, that our society has become, especially in this country, more and more obsessed with time, you know, to the point where we now put these things on our, our wrists that kind of, uh, you know, that, that we think are conveniences, but we're I refuse to wear a watch myself uh, because I feel like I'm chained to time, you know. And the watch that I do have has no hour hands. Uh, or sorry, it has an hour hand, but no second hand. And even the numbers are not there. So I like to know roughly where I am, um, but not down to the digital sort of nanosecond, uh, which I think is sort of inhuman. Um, uh, on your point about how long buildings last, I think it's a great point. And, probably the topic of another of another uh, uh, discussion. But uh, for sure, I spent a lot, lot of time, um, no pun intended, uh, looking at Japanese architecture, uh, where very similarly to, to Singapore, as you explained, um, land prices are so high that you wouldn't dream of keeping the same building on the same lot. So the turnover rate of, of in, in the case of Japan of perfectly working buildings um, are not economically feasible. Um, you know, their use changes, uh, the surroundings change, as you point out. Um, so, uh, for sure, time does uh, impinge on, on everything, including buildings. And I guess my 
my point is that architects uh, probably ought to take a little more cognizance of that uh, in, in many ways. And the way that I'm particularly interested in is how does, not from an economic point of view necessarily, but how do um, or how does the lack of time in, in build space uh, affect the occupants of buildings? You know, we, we've talked about this in the last few weeks where many of us are now spending even more time inside buildings. Um, you know, this, the, the, the less known secret is that we were spending in this country well over 90% of our lives inside buildings anyway before COVID. So it's now probably like 99, in my case, 100%. I don't think I've left my apartment for two weeks, now, which is extreme, but um, you know, it is very, very high anyway. So the lack of time, if these two things are important to us, space and time, and they are, um, you know, the lack of time in built space seems like, a, seems like an issue. Let me, let me roll the first uh, image. And, well, before uh, you do that, I just oh, want yeah. to yeah, two more ahead. comments, yeah. Um, where you're right about COVID. I mean, COVID um, changes uh, our our state of mind. It's an altered state we live in now. You're two weeks, and and I have the same experience. Um, I haven't left my house very much. I'm I'm happy my house has a second room that I can play in. Um, if I didn't have a second room, like many people in the state, you know, do, uh, that, that becomes really claustrophobic. Uh, so so this the space. If the space is adequate, then you don't think about it. Uh, if the space is not adequate, you do think about it, especially if you're cooped up. The other thing is time itself. I don't know how you feel over the two weeks, but I, I kind of lose track of time. Uh, I, I mark my time with specific events, but they seem to be harder to find now. Um, and, and I go through my, my obligations. They seem to sort of get away from me now. Um, so I don't feel that my commitment to time, my connection with time, uh, as it would be you know, in an office setting or a studio setting downtown is yeah. the same. I'm in a, a kind of mush of time now. And I believe if I'm in a mush of time, so are you and so are most people who spend all their time at home without, without a, a commitment, a demand, a wristwatch. Right. Yeah, no, it's true. Uh, things are drifting. You know, uh, many people have commented that their, uh, their productivity has gone up. You know, they're not goofing off. They're working longer hours. You know, they end up working after dinner. And well, I was doing all that kind of stuff on the go as an academic. But my weekends are completely indistinguishable from my weekdays now, totally. Which is not good. I'm not proud of that. Um, uh, back to back to uh, your comments about architecture, kind of, and, and time. Um, and the aging of buildings. John Ruskin um, said that, uh, uh, you know, we can do all sorts of things, uh, um, you know, we can live and die with, with um, uh, but we can't remember without architecture. And yet modern architecture was supposedly timeless. You know, they actually made the claim, ridiculous so it sounds, you know, that those modern white boxes, you know, you put them up and they'd be forever. You didn't have to change them. Well, of course, you know, the second week, they started to look a little less white. And after a few years, if you didn't maintain them, they looked decidedly sad, much sadder than classical buildings that were designed with the notion that they would actually, you know, age. Uh, so, you know, you can deny we can ignore time, uh, but I only have to look in the mirror in the morning to realize it's not ignoring me. You know? So, you know, we might want to pay attention. To it. Let me show you this first image, which is kind of what uh, I hope it's moving. Um, maybe you could click on it uh, to get that to move. I don't know. Um, oh, that's a pity. It's not uh, should be a, a, a video, but you're going to have to imagine the um, uh, the flames flickering and uh, the sound of crackling and the water is moving, and that's the environment that our distant ancestors would have grown up in uh, or, or evolved in, and really that's the environment that that we um, are used to physiologically. We haven't really changed. We still need that stuff. Now, if we go to the second image. Um, this is what I meant by modern architecture. Um, you know, uh, there's there's really very little connection to the past. You know, you you uproot people out of terrace houses, which were um, not great, but they were not bad. Um, put them in high-rise buildings, and they're completely disconnected from their roots, from their neighbours, from their community. You put people in offices like the one in the middle. Um, there's you know no change from from hour to hour. Um, and there's no kind of uh, sense of the future in, in many cases. So uh, what I've been looking at is 
uh, to look at time not from some sophisticated point of view, but absolutely from the point of view of what do regular people think about when they think about time, and they think about it really in these three domains, the past, the present, and the future. So that's what, what I've been, uh, been looking at. So if you go to the next image, um, this is the hearth. Uh, we call that an archetype. It's a, it's a type that um, anyone would recognize, even if you grew up in a high-rise building and never went camping, there still seems to be a fascination with, uh, with, with the fire. Um, and it seems to be timeless and it seems to transcend culture. So um, these kind of things, I think, and Jung, Carl Jung, uh, would say, well, they're appealing to a collective unconscious, you know, that we don't consciously remember necessarily, but there's something deep inside us remembers, or that remembers, um, sitting around a campfire, even though we can't for the life of ourselves uh, actually remember doing that, perhaps, but, uh, but it's, it, it transcends uh, the individual memory. Sure, it's so, anthropological, it's anthropological, it's a... Right. It's a driven thing. It's built into you. It's um, uh, what's the word? It's uh, baked in, and yep. and it's the same thing with water. You know, I mean, we came from the water, and yep. so uh, there's there's always a pleasure in going back to water. People need to go to bodies of water for the same reason, I think. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, we're not necessarily conscious. You know, I never grew up near the ocean, but boy, it has an enormous. You know, if I look up from my screen, I can see the ocean, and this is what I wanted to do all my life. You know. And yet, I didn't. I was 50 miles away from the ocean, which might as well have been a million miles. You know, I, we didn't go very often, but it has, as you say, a profound, deep effect. Yeah. Um, you know, you're then, talking about fire. Um, uh, fire. And, 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 fire. And you know, what, what's interesting to me is that fire. If you go back to the uh, uh, the clan of the Bear Cave, uh, way back when, remember that one, that prehistoric thing. Yeah. So it's a very good book. Um, it was um, it was a place where you gathered uh, and structures in general. I hope you'll agree with me. Structures in general over the life of the species have been places to gather uh, until recent years. You know, any structure was a place. You know, going back to classical times or before and after, it's a place where everybody got together and it facilitated that. It it protected you in a group. These days, they built condos that are so small. And, and they have, you know, the, sort of the breakdown of the family. Yet one person lives alone most of the time, stays in the house most of the time. It's not like it was. It's not like it has been. Right. No, and, and I'm not suggesting that we necessarily turn the clock back. But some of these things um, still have, you know, even for those people uh, who live on their own um, in a high rise, uh, as I do, um, you know, the, these things still have a powerful resonance and that's what interests me um there's another one uh, so oh before we move on then the hearth uh, some some architectural theorists have said that that's the beginning of architecture and you were getting very close to that the, the first time somebody sat down and made a fire basically that was architecture because as you absolutely rightly said people gathered around for the heat right to get cooked food to be protected from animals but yeah but also for the camaraderie you know, like we're all in this together so you know you know the hearth is, is fundamental to, to architecture and yet you know if i look around my apartment um no hearth you know and uh, in, and that's the case for many if, if we go to the next one um along with the hearth if we go to the next image uh, is the sloping ceiling um the sloping canopy um which again even if you grew up as i did in a flat ceiling uh, house um, I still long to live in an attic and have them, luckily, in many cases. And I still find it far more comforting to be under that sheltering roof than under a flat plastic ceiling. Um, again, these are archetypes that, that uh, and there is some evidence. We've done some experiments to show that people really do prefer. Uh, and they do. Historically, connect. historically, why is that? Where, where does that come from? Uh, well, uh, it, it, it's very practical, you know, that that is the, uh, the shape that most effectively sheds uh, water, you know, so from any place in the world that has any appreciable uh, precipitation, 
you know, you figure out, well, if you invert it, right, you realize you end up very wet very quickly, right? Um, if you make a V-shape and it rains, or if you make it flat, I, my, my description of a flat roof is a pond waiting to happen, right? So, um, so, so, you know, that says what it does. It, it, it it's also security, it. don't you think? For example, some, uh, some rocks come down, a tree falls. If you have a flat roof, it's going to collapse. Yeah, if you have a pointed roof, it'll deflect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, even for those, again, even uh, similar to the heart, even for those who didn't grow up in, in spaces like that, there seems to be, as you put it, a baked in preference for this kind of space. Uh, even for people from the Middle East, for example, who uh, didn't have a need to have this kind of protection from a great deal of precipitation. I've asked people and, and, and many of them still find that, that that shape still has a symbolic meaning to it. Um, so this is not, you know, uh, direct indi individual memory. It's a sort of collective um, uh, memory, as, as Jim would have put it. Um, there's one more, uh, which you may or may not be uh, familiar with. Uh, if we go to the next image, uh, one more archetype. This is uh, known in, in our field, uh, in landscape architecture, as refuge and prospect. Basically, this is the view from, you know, the proverbial cave mouth, where nobody can creep up. Um, on you from behind, but you can survey the scene in front of you and you can see threats or opportunities coming long before they've arrived. And the opposite, of course, is when you're stuck out there on show, waiting to be gobbled up, right? Um, so this is an empowering inhabitant, uh, a habitat, right? Animals, likewise, you know, will, will, will frequently place themselves in a corner where nobody can surprise them and they can see everything in front of them. So this is super primitive. And, uh, you know, if you find yourself in, you know, in the corner of the, of the kitchen at the party, then that's what you're doing, basically, is, is reverting to this primitive archetype that makes this feel <laughs> secure. You know, it's like, nobody's going to surprise me and I can see who's coming, you know, and uh, either evade them or, or stay here, you know. Well, you know, the problem is in modern residences, you know, there are multiple entrance and yeah. uh, exits. And, uh, yeah. you know, if you watch just a few horror movies, you find out that the bad guy comes in the other entrance and you don't know and you are surprised. Every cave should have a back door, I believe. There was a design fault. I, I absolutely agree. You know, because, uh, you know your, your protective cave becomes your tomb if the saber tooth discovers you're in there and just decides to camp outside. You know, what are you going to do? <laughs> At the end of you. You starve or you become dinner. <laughs> um, so, um, so that's the, you know, these are, these are, these are tools that we have in our architectural toolkit then for evoking, I would argue, positive connections to the past in, in, in built environments by um, by simply using these archetypes that are that are that we're hardwired to, to to respond to. And it's not that people have to go consciously thinking about these things. You know, the best outcome is that they go, I really like that space. I have no idea why, but I really like that space with the slope ceiling or with the hearth or um, with that window seat that I can sit in and I can look at everything outside, but nobody can see me. So do you tell them about the uh, anthropological history of these things? Uh, I don't think when you, you need talk to. to a client or you just let them you yeah. find, find their own resonance themselves. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you, you know, uh, people should uh, join the dots for themselves. And if these are as powerful as I think they are, um, people will, you know, they'll go, I really like this, you know, the minute you find yourself as an architect having to explain, you've lost, you've lost the architect. Yeah. You, you, but you know, you see, you see uh, pictures and you, I mean, we, we've all been in residences and offices. Gee, I really like your description of the office where it's intended not to tell you what time it is. It's intended, it's, it's like intended to make it feel active or make it potentially active 24 by 7. You're not supposed to know. Your intellectual juices are supposed to flow all day and all night. That way they get more work out of you, you know? Maybe that's why people like to spend their time at home these days. This is um, just like a casino. Do you realize that? I've never thought about ex that. Oh, yeah, happen. sure. Right, yeah. Um, so, but anyway, the, uh, I think if you walked around some of the modern buildings done by architects, uh, you will find none of these anthropological influences, none of them. And it will be cold and it will, you know, have all the wrong metrics to it, um, but it'll be modern looking. I'm sure that there must be some kind of uh, dichotomy within the architectural community about that, where you build this kind of stuff that has nothing human in it, 
uh, and yet and yet people are willing to spend a lot of money for it anyway. Well, there's an element of fashion in everything, and and, and architecture is not immune to that. But um, what I'm talking about is the is the very opposite of fashion. You know, this stuff is is original in the sense of it goes right back to the beginning. Not original because I thought of it this morning, you know, and it's the latest thing. Um, but this stuff is is hardwired into us. And I think, uh, um, you know, I, I will say to my students very often, look, uh, it's great that you've got an architectural training, but you're going to be no good to man or beast if you don't remember what it was like before you were an architect. What's it like to be a human being? Inside that architect, there ought to be a human being and a child, right? And if you forget that, then you're of no use. You just become somebody who talks to other architects and uh, and basically has forgotten that we're actually not just paying lip service to, we actually do serve other human beings. So understanding how human beings not so much think but feel is critical. Otherwise, how could you possibly do your job? And that's not something that's that's talked about a lot. You know, that it, it is, it, there's so much to learn in architecture, the tools of the trade and, and, and the techniques. Um, it's easy to forget, and I did for, for many years, you know, that, why are we actually doing this? You know, uh, what is the mark of success? And the mark of success in my book is evoking really great feelings in, in somebody who probably will never understand, never fully rationally understand why do they feel so much better in that space? That's fine. You know, or worse. It's our job to do that. Or worse. You know, I tell you the truth. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not in love with 40-foot escarpments. Um, you know, and, and you see those in Kaka'ako with some of those buildings they built down there. And my wife and I were down there, this is before COVID, we were down there walking around and I actually got turned around, Kevin. I didn't yeah. know where I was. I said, I lived in this, in this city for 50 years and I'm yeah. walking down a street, which I have walked down a thousand times, I didn't recognize the street. It was very disturbing to me, not only because it was, you know, completely, um, what sort of, was sterile, yeah. Um, but because it had changed, it had taken away my landmarks, my reference part, reference points. I didn't know where I was. Yeah, this is so important. And uh, honestly, every conversation I have with you, Jay, leads to me thinking of like, oh yeah, we should talk about that sometime. You know, <laughs> these landmarks. I'm, I've been writing about that recently. That it is enormously important. You know, that, that there are some fixed things in our lives, and you know, you. Uh, both fit, literally, as you were talking about, you know, a, a mountain, the horizon, uh, familiar buildings, whatever. But, you know, across your entire life, there have to be some things. We like a little bit of change, but we do not like chaos. We do not like to come back to our house and find that everything is not where they, you left it. You know, We're creatures that like kind of an 80-20 kind of change uh, or a ratio of familiar to to, to change, you know, and we don't like 100% familiar, that's kind of um, mind-numbingly boring, but we hate chaos as well, so it is disturbing, and I've had the same sort of, uh, that happened to me a couple of years ago in Oregon where it snowed, and I lived there for 20 years, and I got completely lost because the, the snow uh, uh, removed all landmarks, and I stopped somebody and said, can you uh, direct me to Hilliard, and they said, you're standing on yeah, <laughs> which is pretty embarrassing. You know, I mean, it was like four feet of snow, but really, you know, it removed all, and it, it's really worrying. You know, you, you know you're in a familiar world, but you go right back to you just lost your mother, you know, uh, for the first time. You go, oh my God, it's the end of the world, you know? Yeah. Um, so these are, yeah. I want to tell you a, a short thing that relates to this. You know, I, in my earlier day, I used to go hiking on Mauna Loa. Mauna Loa has a series of ahus. And Ahu is a, a stone cairn. <clears throat> they built up the stones and it's like triangular and it's sometimes two, three, two, three feet high. Mm -hmm. And you can see them at some distance because the, the lava up there at the top is uh, re relatively flat. I mean, it's, there's no obstruction. So all you can see in the dis distance is the cairn. <clears throat> and so it's comforting to know that the cairn is going to take you somewhere. It's a reference point, it's a landmark. Yeah. And if anybody knocks down the cairn, or the can falls down, yeah. um, you're lost. And I yeah. think this is one of those um, baked in points that yeah. you have to have landmarks. You yeah. have to have reference points. You have to know where you are or you're very uncomfortable. So I've lost my weekend, which is a reference point. You know, you've lost your going into the office at whatever time, you know, these, these are refer reference points in time that we also need, you know, that when time disclosed continuously, you know, we kind of go, 
what does it matter? You know, it's whether it's Tuesday or Sunday. You know? And and I don't know that that's necessarily good. You know, I don't want to be a slave to that, but I also don't like the idea of like this one continuous. You know, so we do need some kind of references. So um, see how I brought that back to time there, Jane. You always do. <laughs> <laughs> so how is it going to change for us in the new abnormal? I'm serious. Well, I believe we're in an altered state that's going to last for a while. Well, uh, let's go to the next image. Um, uh, perfect intro. Um, these should be moving. Unfortunately, they're not. But, uh, but a couple of weeks ago, we did talk about how to introduce change into, uh, into architectural spaces or into indoor spaces. Then. And uh, any kind of... Um, perceived sense of change uh, connects us to the present you know where uh, if it gets our attention it makes us present um, which you know if you paid any attention to things like mindfulness and all the rest of it uh, you know being present is is enormously important you know because if we're not careful uh, we spend our well most most stress for example um, is as a result of um, there are some stresses that happen right now. You know, you're stood in the middle of the road and there's a bus coming, you know, but they're rare. Most of our stress in, in today's world comes from, wow, I wish that hadn't happened, uh, you know, and regret. Or, oh God, I hope that doesn't happen, you know. Uh, and of course, we spend, <laughs> we spend time, um, a lot of time, stressing over, over past events that we can't alter and future events that, that may not happen. Instead of actually being in present, where you can actually get things done and interact with the world, and uh, being well, aware. Don't of that. you think a big driver? This goes back to anthropology too. A big driver is keeping up. <clears throat> you got to keep up with uh, the leader. You got to keep up with the pack. We yeah. we are pack animals. We are pack yeah. mammals, as it were. And I can, you know, I visualize. Uh, uh, this is out of another movie, uh, Quest for Fire, also oh, about okay. the prehistoric yeah, yeah. period 100,000 years ago. Um, yeah, yeah. So in Quest of Fire, you have to keep up. If you don't keep up, you're a straggler. If you're a yeah. straggler, then those threats are going to get you. And yeah. so you keep up then yeah. and now. And the way to keep up conceptually is with time. Yeah, um, uh, it is a resource. Uh, you know, uh, um, you have to be careful how you use your time. You know, I mean, uh, you can you can fritter it away and or, or you can um, store it up, you know. And but but the thing about time that uh, that differs fundamentally from space is that you can go out if you have enough money, and I know you do. Um, you can go out and buy space, real estate, right? Um, anytime, you know. And uh, I believe the last time they checked, the universe was still expanding. Not that it really affects us much, but. But um, guess what? The minute you and I entered this world, um, our, our allocated amount of time, which of course is unknown, which makes it even tougher, um, is diminishing. The only thing we know is it's limited and it's diminishing as we speak. And that's totally different from space where you can go. But this goes to a final question I want to ask you. We're out of time. And that is, uh, so you spoke of your two weeks. Um, and, um, and of course, the you know, the, the, the limited amount of time we all have on the, on the planet, who knows how much, but it's limited. Um, so the two weeks, and in my case, the same thing. Is it lost? Have I frittered it away? Would I have preferred to do other things? Or does this have value of equal value or even greater value? Um, how, how is this COVID time get marked up in, in the book of life? I personally, um... I mean, I joked um, rather, rather, rather inappropriately with, with friends that uh, I've, I've been um, preparing for social distancing all my life. So it's hard as an introvert, you know, I, I've hardly blinked. Um, I mean, clearly it's had, I do miss, you know, I enjoy it. The only reason I come on your show, uh, Jay, is just I need somebody to talk to, you know, you realize. I'm that. always available for you, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, but seriously, um, uh, terrible though it's been, um, uh, and, and scary as hell, you know, especially for somebody my age uh, um, or older. Uh, I, I think it has created a lot of introspection and, uh, and it will change the way people work. And um, how long those changes will, will, will go on, I don't know. Um, uh, but I don't think it's going to be, uh, and many people have said this before me, that, you know, just back to business as usual. Um, so strange though it may sound, I, I think um, we are living through a unique 
just as the Spanish flu would have been a uniquely scary, or any world war would have been a unique, uniquely scary experience that changes people and changes the world, I think we're living through one now. Um, and I'm not even as affected as a lot of people who've lost their jobs and lost loved ones. And you know, um, those kind of things can happen without the world changing, and it ought to change. You know, I, I don't. I think it would be offensive if um, if if this tragedy ended and we just said okay back to normal then you know it would be an offense to to all the people and all the suffering that's going to happen we yeah. will all of us will have time to uh, to do some some introspection on it i think one way or the other and what interests me is that um you know covid caused it, 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 it was a part of the core one of the many causes of the george floyd uh, protests around the world people yeah. were just too happy to get out of limited space they were they were feeling you know the pressure right. the, of claustrophobia and all that. And this this was a, a a release, a relief that uh, that was important enough, you know, to take the risk of going out on the street. <clears throat> the other thing is, uh, and, and I learned this from you today, is that there is a a huge relationship between space and time, and, oh, yeah. and those are the two most important things. <clears throat> I think you said this at the outset. Those are the two most important things in our lives. And we have to be mindful of them, yeah? Well, I would argue that, that, um, that, that time actually uh, outstrips um, space, which is the opposite of what most architects, um, you know, uh, most architects uh, understandably are preoccupied with space. And I'm, I'm saying, well, it is important. That is our discipline. That's our, our thing. Um, but time actually may be more important to, to, to people. So we need to integrate time more actively um, yeah. into spaces to, you know, it's very important that we be able to um, recollect, remember in a positive way. It's very important that we be present. And it's very important that we have something to look forward to. You deny that and you lose. Well, I, I look forward to our next show. And if you're talking about time, <clears throat> uh, we're out of it. Uh, so that's Kevin Newt. We've been talking about time and space, a really interesting, even luscious kind of uh, discussion. I hope we can do something equally interesting next time, Kevin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Aloha.